Thanks. Uh, thank you to the Devever Institute for hosting this important series and for the opportunity to participate. And to all of you for attending the discussion tonight. Um, I know it'll be an engaging dialogue and we I'm honored to be part of this group. So to start us off tonight, we thought it would be helpful to review some key definitions and concepts that will assist us in our discussion. So first, what is medical assistance in dying or MAID? Medical assistance in dying in Canada includes both euthanasia and assisted suicide, where a physician or nurse practitioner prescribes a lethal dose of drug to end a person's life. In euthanasia, the physician or nurse practitioner directly administers the drug, usually by the intravenous route. And in assisted suicide, the physician or nurse practitioner gives a prescription for the lethal drugs which the person self-administers. Almost all cases of MAID in Canada are euthanasia. Why do people request an assisted death or MAID? Evidence demonstrates that most requests for MAID are motivated by a desire for control, by fear of dying, fear of future pain or suffering, and worry about being a burden to others. We call these existential issues. Requests are not due to uncontrolled physical symptoms such as pain or shortness of breath, contrary to media portrayals. The Canadian data that, that provides this evidence is similar to that of other jurisdictions who have legalized assisted suicide or euthanasia. What is the difference between MAID and palliative care? The core philosophy of palliative care affirms life, sees dying as a normal part of life, and focuses on living well until natural death. Palliative care intends to alleviate suffering, enhance dignity, and improve quality of life. It does not seek to hasten or prolong death. Its approach is to provide impeccable symptom assessment and management and supportive care for the whole person, including physical, psychosocial, emotional, and spiritual issues. In the tradition of Cicely Saunders, the founder of the hospice movement, this type of total care requires care of the patient and their family as the unit of care in a team-based approach. In contrast to palliative care, the core philosophy of MAID is that it is ethical to end a person's life at their request. Assisted death intends to end the life of a person who is suffering. So death becomes the solution to suffering. And the approach is to cause the immediate death of the person through the administration of a lethal dose of drugs. Unfortunately, palliative care continues to be conflated with MAID and described by MAID advocates and lobby groups such as Dying with Dignity as an extension of palliative care or part of the continuum of palliative care. It is not. International and national palliative care associations and palliative medicine specialty societies and even the Canadian Medical Association recognize that palliative care is a distinct practice from MAID. This misrepresentation of, of MAID as part of the continuum of palliative care and the ongoing use of the euphemistic language medical assistance in dying, confuses people about what palliative care is. It perpetuates myths that palliative care hastens death and the stigma that palliative care is a death service that we in palliative care have been working to change for over 40 years. These myths and stigmas continue to serve as a barrier to early palliative care involvement in serious illness, which we know improves quality of life, reduces anxiety and depression, improves goal concordant care, reduces caregiver distress, and in some cases even helps people live longer. How does palliative care address suffering? In palliative care, we know that expressing a desire to die and talking about hastening death are often normal expressions of grief and loss and coming to terms with one's own mortality in the face of a devastating diagnosis or a change in condition. Dr. Har Dr. Harvey Chachanoff's work in psychiatry and palliative care demonstrates that the desire to die fluctuates and often dissipates within two weeks. Such expressions of distress can be normalized and supported with skilled palliative care interventions to better understand the nature of the suffering the person is experiencing and how to address it. Holistic, dignity-conserving palliative care interventions, which I believe Dr. Margaret Cottle spoke about last week, um, such as dignity-conserving therapy, which was developed by Dr. Tachinoff, focuses on restoring purpose 
meaning, and hope in the face of loss and grief. These therapies help a person to focus on living while dying and provide support to accompany people on their journey so they don't feel abandoned or alone in their suffering. Thus in palliative care, a request for hastened death is fully and sensitively explored to understand the nature of the person's suffering and to determine what supports can be offered, often creatively, to address these existential issues to preserve and enhance the dignity of the person so they can get back to focusing on living. Next, I wanna talk about who provides palliative care. Providing a palliative approach to care is actually everyone's responsibility, not just the business of a small number of specialist palliative care physicians and nurses. Specialist palliative care teams, like the one I work in, does deal with very complex palliative care issues, but as Pallium Canada well describes, every person has the opportunity to transform our society into a skilled, informed, and compassionate one that provides a palliative approach to care. Care that addresses and supports a patient and their family's psychological, spiritual, social, and physical issues in line with their wishes and helps prepare for eventual life closure. A palliative approach to care can and should be provided by every health professional in every discipline in every setting of care, as early as possible in the diagnosis of a life-threatening or progressive illness, supported with, by 24-7 access to specialist care when needed for those complex issues. Core competencies for a palliative approach to care need to be embedded in the training of all healthcare professionals, in keeping with the new Canadian Interdisciplinary Palliative Care Competency Framework that was released in the fall 2021. The community also has an important role to play in supporting those on a palliative care journey. A movement called the Compassionate Communities was established to focus on dying as a social phenomenon, not a medical one. Their founder, Dr. Alan Kelly Har, and I might've mispronounced his name, I apologize, describes how dying is not fundamentally a medical event. Rather, it's a social event that happens in a family and in a community. Dying is about living, loving, and working with a life-threatening illness until one can no longer do so, and the longer part of this occurs outside of formal healthcare institutions. A compassionate community is a community that recognizes that care for one another at a time of crisis and loss is not simply a task for health and social services, but is everyone's responsibility. I think this is an important concept as we think about MAID, knowing that many requests for MAID are born out of fear of being a burden to others and fear of future suffering and how MAID has over-medicalized death. But we can talk about that more later in our discussion. A compassionate community is focused on, on empowering individuals and groups within a community to provide important physical, emotional, social, spiritual, and practical supports to patients, families, and caregivers within the community by giving citizens concrete ways that they can help one another. By bringing people together, for example, reducing social isolation, loneliness through sunshine calls at the start of each day, coffee groups, library projects, or happy to chat park benches. These are all ways that compassionate communities bring people together. Helping people find and access services they need to support them in living. For example, meals, shopping, chores, and escorts to appointments by promoting advanced care planning, including funeral planning, by normalizing talking about dying as a natural part of life, providing education how most often natural death is comfortable and peaceful, and if there are more difficult symptoms, how palliative care can address those symptoms and make sure death is comfortable. We can normalize conversations about wishes and preferences, beliefs and values that contribute to the advanced care planning, and they provide death education in schools, seniors' homes, and even libraries. Compassionate communities create a community, a community culture that is confident and capable of offering and providing help to one another. I think this is what bioethicist Carter Sneed describes as uncalculated giving. And shifts culture from one in which we instinctively decline help from others to one that readily asks for and, ac and accepts help what Carter Sneed describes as gracious receiving. Professor Carter Sneed is a bioethicist at the University of Notre Dame. And in his recent book, 
what it means to be human, the case for the body in public bioethics. He describes how human flourishing requires an anthropology of embodiment, that by virtue of being in, that, of being in a body, by, being in, by virtue of our embodiment, we are made for love and friendship, and that we require this network of uncalculated giving and gracious receiving to be able to flourish. He describes, viewed through the lens of the anthropology of embodiment, all living members of the human family are worthy of care and protection, regardless of age, disability, cognitive capacity, dependence, and most of all, regardless of the opinions of others. Everyone can participate in the network of giving and receiving, even if only as the passive recipient of unconditional love and concern. I think the compassionate community movement helps to establish this network of uncalculated giving and gracious receiving that Professor Sneed refers to. And it may help to reduce the fear that we become burdens to those around us when we need help. I'm gonna stop here for now, lots to think about, but I look forward to being able to discuss more specifically about palliative care and the intersection with need later on in our roundtable.